to worry about anybody else. I got to get to heaven. I got to do it for myself. I'm just trying. I'm just trying. I'm trying. Trying to make it. I'm trying. I'm just trying. I'm trying to make it. I'm trying to make it. I'm crying. Oh, yes, yes, Come on, Jesus. We will come to order now. First of all, I'd like to say good morning to everybody. Today is May the 15th, 2022, Bible study guide number 11. Today's title, Freedom and the Law. The background scripture comes from Galatians chapter 3. The printed text is Galatians chapter 3, verses 18 through 29. And this morning, our devotional reading will come from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. At this time, I would like for everyone to join me in the verse of song. I'm so glad, so glad, trouble don't last always. Oh, I'm so glad. Trouble don't last always, I'm so glad, so glad, trouble don't last always. Oh my Lord, oh my Lord, what shall I do, what shall I do? I'm so glad God is using me. Oh, I'm so glad God is using me. I'm so glad, so glad God is using me. Oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord, what shall I do? What shall I do? Good morning. This morning I'm reading to you from Second Thessalonians verses chapter two verses thirteen through seventeen. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called unto you by gospel to obtaining the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thereof, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions with have which ye have been taught, which, whether by word or epistle, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your heart and establish you in every good word and work. I read you from Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Thank you. Let us pray. This morning, Father, we come to you with thanksgiving in our heart. 
We thank you, Father, for just letting us see another day. We thank you, Father, for touching us with that finger of love. Thank you, Father, for our health and our strength. First of all, Father, we want to thank you for your darling son, Jesus, that died on the cross for all our sins. We thank you, Father, for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Father God, we pray that you just continue to touch the hearts of the people in Russia. I pray that you just touch their hearts this morning so they can have a ceasefire and, and can stop bombing the people over in Ukraine. We pray that you to continue to protect, protect the people in Ukraine. We pray that you just continue to keep your hands over this whole situation before we come into another world war. We pray for our sick and our shut-in. We pray for our bereaved family. We pray that you bless our services this morning from the Sunday school throughout the morning service. Bless the pastors. He brings the word. Bless everyone that's bowed with me in prayer. These blessings we ask in your darling son, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Joys are flowing like a river since the comfort has come. He abides with us forever. Make a trust in heart is home. O blessed quietness, holy quietness, what assurance in my soul. On the stormy seas, Jesus speaks to me, and the billows cease to roll. Oh, blessed quietness, holy quietness, what assurance in my soul. On the stormy seas, Jesus speaks to me, and the billows cease to roll. I would like to thank everyone for participating in our opening services this morning. And at this time, we will turn it over to Rev. Connor for our Sunday school lesson. Thank you, Deacon McKenzie. Good morning, everyone. Truly, indeed, it's a blessed day to be in the Lord's house once again. And just giving praise and thanks for our Lord and Savior just for allowing us to wake to see another day. But truly indeed, as Deacon McKenzie said, let us continually keep uh, Ukraine lifted up in our prayers for what they are facing and dealing with, with the confrontation with Russia. Let us just continually keep them both lifted up. Um, for many stories are you know, going back and forth, reasons why, reasons this, but at the end of it all, there are people being hurt on both sides. And so we need to keep them lifted up in our prayers that God's will will be done and that soon and very soon they will see a pathway to peace um, that both sides can continue on in the direction that they can go for their countries. But truly, indeed, God has been good to us here in the United States and has continually watched over us through all that we are facing. And so let us be in prayer for our communities, for our loved ones. Um, I'd ask that you all view us live and here at the church. Just keep my mother lifted up. She had back surgery on this past week. And so just want to keep her lifted up in prayer. Um, and also just look over those that are sick and shed in. Um, that their needs will be met and that their minds and hearts will be touched and healed. And so this morning our lesson is freedom and the law. Freedom and the law. Our Bible background is coming from Galatians chapter 3. Printed text Galatians 3 verses 18 through 29. And our devotional readings come from uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13 through 17. And so our aim for change this morning tells us we will explore the difference between living according to God's law and living by faith in Christ Jesus. We'll celebrate the freedom God's promise gives to all who believe in Christ and practice ways they can embrace this liberation and oneness in Christ. 
And so we have a wonderful, wonderful lesson in store. Um, as usual, I'm pretty sure Deacon McKenzie, I get myself in trouble. And I had to dig myself out of it somewhere or another, but probably had to dig a little hard on this one. And so this lesson we have this morning is a wonderful lesson talking about freedom and the law. Galatians 3, 18 through 29. And so the background this morning tells us that for Paul, God's uh, promised blessing extended to all of Abraham's heirs, both the Jews as well as Gentiles who shared Abraham's faith. Look at that again. Both Jews as well as Gentiles who shared Abraham's faith. Now, some Jews did not accept this teaching, believing that new believers must become Jewish in order to follow Jesus. Look at that again. Some of them didn't accept it because they believed that new believers had to become Jewish in order to follow Jesus. Paul countered that by anyone who lives by faith in Christ Jesus the seed of Abraham are the sons of Abraham and recipients of what? The promise. Some of them didn't accept the teaching because they thought that new believers had to become Jewish. My people today, what if we had to become Jewish in order to follow Jesus Christ? Not knocking against the Jews. But what if we had to become Jewish to follow Jesus Christ? I'm digging at something with that. Because we don't have to become Jewish to follow Jesus Christ. But isn't it something how maybe we got to become Hispanic to follow Jesus Christ? Maybe we got to become white to follow Jesus Christ. Let's just look at it now. Maybe we got to be black to follow Jesus Christ. What if we had to become something else other than who we are to follow Jesus Christ? Which leads me to my question. How do modern Christians add unnecessary requirements to following God? How do we as Christians... I can point at myself, I'm a Christian. How do we add unnecessary requirements to follow God? Anybody want to answer that one? Making up man-made rules. Oh, making up man-made rules. Just give me one, Deacon McKenzie. Can you just give me one? Just give me one man-made rule we make up. You have to dress a certain way to come to church. <laughs> Is that scripture based? Yeah. <laughs> so you probably talking about women. You got to come here with your dress down to your ankles. Guys got to be, am I, am I buttoned up right? Can't see no hairs, can you? I, I look okay, Sister Claire. Okay, got to have your shirt buttoned up. Probably the first button. You know, uh, Probably can't wear shorts because you're showing your legs. Uh, can't have short, short dresses on. So we make up these, these unnecessary requirements to follow God. Which goes back to what I said. What if we had to be um, a different nationality to say that we believe in Jesus? See, it's something how when we look at society today, so many people are unacceptable when it comes to Christianity because you are not of a certain race or a certain color. Now, I know many of you might want to say, well, he's he talking about white folks. Is that part of our society? Yes, it is. You know, um, we have this inferiority complex. If you don't look like this, you ain't got it. If you don't have this much, you ain't got it. And so we bring about unnecessary requirements when it comes to following God. 
Now let's look at the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law. Get someone to read someone to read Galatians chapter three, verse eighteen through twenty two for me. Galatians three eighteen through twenty two. Someone read that for me. For if the inheritance be of law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by the angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Uh, let's go to 22. Yeah, 22. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. But there had been a law given which could have given us very righteousness could have been by the law. But the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. All right, let's start digging. So Paul argues that God gave Abraham a promise. Now get this, 430 years before giving the law. For all y'all that want to live by the law. In order to inherit Abraham's promise of, of blessing, Paul argues one must simply follow Abraham's method of attaining righteousness, which is simply what? Belief. If a person believes and is faithful to God, they will be made righteous. If they expect to inherit uh, righteousness by obeying the law, then they have forgotten that God's family of faith began not on Sinai with the law, but at Haran with the promise. So, God's family of faith did not begin with Moses. The thrust of Paul's argument is to show how the law functions to reveal sin in human nature for what it is. That's all the law did. It revealed sin. So the Greek word translated as transgressions is parabasis and denotes a breach of an existing law. So before the law, it was easy for the Israelites to gloss over sin as, as a subjective thing. But the law shows sin to be an objective reality, a violation of God's standards. Romans seven thirteen. So the law also stimulates faith in a promised seed. So the law also shows us that we have a promised seed that's coming to fulfill the law. So it amazes me how people Deacon McKenzie, they want to, you know, quote the laws. But within the laws, Sister Claire, it promises us a Messiah that's coming to what? Fulfill the law. Right there. Right there. That one line, that one line right there shows some of the people that don't believe in the New Testament that Jesus was being spoken of in the Old Testament. So let's just keep it real. <laughs> If you don't want to believe in the New Testament, Sister Pargo, well, well, I guess I'm a little foolish. You don't believe in the Old Testament because the old, the law, promises the Messiah. So how can you not believe in the Messiah, but you want to believe in the law that promises the Messiah? Something wrong with that picture. Something wrong with that. The law promises us that a seed is coming. So Paul reads the Abrahamic covenant as being made to Abraham and his seed. Since it says seed instead of seeds, which is plural, Paul interprets Jesus as the true heir to Abraham's promise. So as the Israelites come to terms with the reality of sin through the law, they are pointed through the law. They are pointed to the coming Messiah who would deal decisively with sin. So the law was interim pending the coming of the seed who fulfilled the promise. 
So the law was inferior because it was given through what? Now get this. It was given through angels. And a mediatorial role of Moses. So the mediator suggests one who is a liaison between two parties. With that final agreement witnessed by the mediator, the Israelites are contractually obligated to follow what? The law. Now, in contrast to two party to a two party contract of the law, God's promise to Abraham is what? Only one sided. Now, Sister Pargo, when I studied on this one, ooh, you talking about getting fired up. Now, check this out. An angel and Moses, as a mediator, gave the law. And the Israelites, Deacon McKenzie, had to agree, had to sign off. We agree to follow these laws. Now, get this. God told Abraham, y'all got to read your scripture now. God told Abraham to set up sacrifices to formalize their covenant. The sacrifice animals were cut, what, in two and laid out with a path between them. The two parties of the covenant were supposed to walk together, Sister Pargo, between the carcasses and vow that such a brutal faith would await them if one of them violated the agreement. Half of the sheep is over here, half of the sheep is over there. Me and the Lord walk between them, and we agree, Sister Claire, if one of us violate this agreement, this is going to be our faith. Y'all follow me? We shall be cut in half. So, but look at this. God calls Abraham to fall to fall asleep. And as Abraham was asleep, God himself moved between the sacrifices alone, validating the promise himself. Abraham was not obligated to do anything to validate the promise. Therefore, no mediator was needed. This again shows that the promise is superior, uh, superior to the law because its fulfillment does not depend on what? Israel. The promise, the fulfillment does not depend on you and me. God promised it. God sealed it. The law requires two parties to agree. St. Paul, we ain't had to agree on nothing. God's promise stands all on him. It is like, look at it like this. It's like our relationship with our loving parents. We did absolutely nothing, Deacon Walls, to merit being our mother's child. We ain't do nothing. But in deciding to be your mother, our mothers bounded themselves to certain promises to love and protect us that do not depend on anything. If you fail or if you do good, since far go mother's love, it's a mother's love. The Lord knows I messed up growing up, but my mother still loved me. In my bad, in my good, she still showed me love. And that is how it is with God. We have done nothing to deserve his love. Nothing. But he loves us in spite of. Just like a mother loves a child. Would you rather follow the law or follow the promise? The law requires you, Deacon McKenzie, to agree and sign off. And you obligated to it. The promise, you ain't got to do nothing for the promise. All you got to do is believe. <laughs> 
So it's probably going, I'd rather believe. <laughs> because, look, you going to fall short. Right. You will fall short. That's a guarantee. You're going to fall short sometimes. You're going to mess up. But knowing that God still loves you, even though you messed up. But if you skip over here to the law and you mess up, you might lose a hand, you might lose a finger, you might lose a toe. Look, I don't want to be walking around here limping because I done messed up and done lost the leg. But if you go by the promise, you got God's love. So the purpose of the promise was to impart life. In order for the law to replace the promise, it would have to be able to impart life. God did not reveal his law to us so that we would be confused, fail at his regulations, and lose hope for salvation. So the law then must have had a different purpose than actually working out the salvation of those who followed it. So Paul does not completely discount the law, but respectfully calls it scripture. So instead of imparting life the law, Moses condemns all humanity under sin. So the word uh, in the King James translate as concluded is the Greek word uh, sunkleo, and meaning to shut or enclose. So Paul is personifying scripture, the law, as a jailer who keeps a condemned secure what? In prison. So the law wraps around and it snares and limits those that follow it. And before long, it convicts all humanity as being guilty of sin. So therefore, those under the law will appreciate the fact that eternal life is dependent on faith in Christ and therefore open to all who believe. Do you want to be in jail or do you want to be free? See, the law keeps you bound and in. <laughs> What's that, Sister Fargo? That's what the law does. It convicts. You shackle, you chain, you ensnare, you enclose. Ain't got nothing. <laughs> and look at what you have by faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Ain't no life in the law. Ain't no life in the law, Deacon Walls, none. But it points us to our Savior. It points us to our Savior that what? Gives us life. And gives it to us more abundantly. It gives us life. Do you want to be in bondage and shackled and chained by the law? Or do you want to be free and have life in what? Simple belief in Jesus Christ. So the law, we have to appreciate what Jesus gives us if we're dependent upon faith. And so now, we're going to look at the coming of faith. The coming of faith. Someone read Galatians 3, uh, verse 23 through 29 for me. When faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all for ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Therefore is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. And if ye be Christ, if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen. 
name. The promise. All about the promise. The coming of faith. Come on, work with it. It's all about the promise. The only way that you can be released from under the power of sin is what? Through faith in Jesus Christ. It ain't under the law. It's through faith in Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah. The verb kept is a military term meaning to guard a place in order to prevent an escape from inside or an invasion from the outside. So the law, it functioned like a siege, keeping those under it from escaping from the reality of their sin until what? Christ comes. Simply put, it's like this. The law, Deacon Walls, it keeps beating on your head, letting you know you in sin. It just keep beating you on the head. You in sin, you in sin. You, you turn left, you in sin. You turn right, you in sin. That's the law. It functioned like a siege. It kept you bounded. It keeps you from escaping from the reality that you in sin. But it points you to the promised Savior that's coming to release you from that. So these images of the law could make someone think God is harsh and cruel. But in truth, however, God's law encloses his people to keep them safe. The law reminds them of the guilt of their sin. But it also keeps them close to God so that when faith comes and is revealed, they can partake of it. So God ensnared his people in the law so that they could all be gathered together to receive the gift of Jesus all at once. Now look at this. Just as a modern day school, a bus driver, takes the children to school to be taught by the teacher, so the law served as a guide to those under it uh, to Christ for their justification by faith. So the law was like a school, like a bus driver. And the law takes us to what? Christ as our justification. So the law is wise and useful, but it is not the end goal. It was always designed to lead followers to what? To Christ. So, since Christ had come and fulfilled the promise, the law was no longer needed. That bus driver is no longer needed. So just as a child does not need the school bus driver any longer once they get to the schoolhouse, God's followers are no longer under law now that Christ is here to teach us. You don't need the school bus no more. You with the teacher. So since you with the teacher, you don't need a ride. Because guess what? Sister Clara, I ain't going back out to catch the bus. I'm staying in the house with the teacher. <laughs> and I'm going to live and walk by faith. Look, I got all the clothes on I need. I got one wardrobe on. I don't need to change no more. So think about that now. You need the law to drive you to the school. How many of y'all still want to keep catching the bus? Now, we used to pick back in the day, Sister Pargo, those riding on the short bus. Y'all want to keep riding on the short bus? I ain't trying to offend nobody, but you want to keep riding on the short bus? Or do you just want to get on to school and just stay at school? Because, see, you got all the protection. You got all the provisions. You got everything you need in the schoolhouse. And we're going to get to that later, Sister Pargo. Slow down now. See, you got everything you need in the schoolhouse. You don't need to go nowhere else. You got lunch, you got dinner, you got breakfast, you got everything. You don't need to leave for nothing. 
So you ain't got to go back out and catch the bus and go back and then catch the bus again to come back to school. Just stay at school. <laughs> Just stay in school. <laughs> so special emphasis is placed on the word all, which here includes what? Both Jews and Gentiles. See, now I'm finna deal with society. So faith in Christ, not obedience to the law, confers the privileges of a child of God. Christians are not called children of Moses because they follow the law. They are not called children of Israel because they have the right bloodlines. They are not even called children of Abraham hoping for a promise of land and blessings. See, see y'all got to listen to what I'm saying here. See, I'm dealing with all you, you, you racist folks. All that deals with all you prosperity folks is all right here. They are not called children of Abraham because they are hoping for a promise of land and blessings. They are not called children of Abraham of Israel because they have the right what? Bloodlines. Christians are children of God Himself because we identify ourselves with Christ Himself. God's what? Only son. By faith we trust that Christ is the fulfillment of God's promises to save his people. And by faith we see him as the one true seed of Abraham, the true and faithful Israel, the prophet greater than Moses. By faith then we follow Christ's example and identify ourselves with him, becoming God's child just as Christ is himself. It doesn't matter if you're white, doesn't matter if you're black, doesn't matter if you're rich, doesn't matter if you're poor, doesn't matter what socioeconomic class you come from, none of that even matters. As long as you believe in Jesus Christ. Only faith in Christ is required to be joined to him. The law is not needed, nor any part of the law is needed. Get this, even baptism itself is an outward sign of an inward change. So if you're baptized in Christ, it's an outward sign of an inward change. You don't need the law. You don't need the law. You don't need any part of the law. It doesn't matter if you're Jew. It doesn't matter if you're Gentile, doesn't matter if you're white, doesn't matter if you're black. Long as you believe in Jesus Christ, you are a Christian. And all you got to do now is walk the walk as you talk the talk. That's all you got to do. We have no reason, black, white, no other race, you have no reason to look down on anybody. The Bible tells us, as long as you believe in Jesus Christ, that's all it takes. It ain't about you being white, it ain't about you being man, it ain't about you being a woman, it ain't about you being black, it ain't about you being Hispanic, Jewish, it ain't about none of that. This unity with Christ is tantamount to putting Christ on figuratively as a garment. He highlights the need to make visible our spiritual union with Christ here and now. So in Paul's society, even in our society, I'm sure we've heard the term, clothes did make the man. So once the new Christian has put on Christ, the Christian becomes Christ. So everyone who sees someone who has put on Christ will only see what? The Savior. Now let me ask a question. When people look at you, Sister Claire, what do they see? See, what do people see when they look at us? What I'm getting at is this. Too often we look at folks, Sister Pargo, man, I remember what she did back in the day. 
Man, she used to be out here doing this, doing that. They want to look at your past. What people need to be looking at, Sister Claire, is look at where the Lord done brought me from. <laughs> yeah, I used to do that. But child, let me tell you. Look at what the Lord did for me. That is our testimony. Because we all used to be some wretched back in the day now. <laughs> Young that don't know better. He said, Look, I've been there, I've done that. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. You didn't go from here to here. Yeah, that's right. I didn't start out at the top. Right, right. That's still a work in progress. Still a work. We have to look at leaders in love and accept people. Mm -hmm. You know, like you said, uh, we all the same. We're we're uh, we're clothed in Christ, and they need to see that. And if we don't put out that love, if we don't represent Christ, Amen. That's uh, that's how you're clothed in that righteousness. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and see, you just had to walk in it. So you only need one outfit. Yeah, we change outfits. You know, seven days a week. But the only outfit you need is just that one outfit clothed in Jesus Christ. That's the only garment you need. It, and look, it's on the inside, Sister Pargo, but it radiates and glows on the outside. Because it comes out your mouth. It comes out your behavior. It comes out how you carry yourself. It ain't about the long dress down to your ankles. It ain't about none of that. Because I done seen a whole lot of sisters got they dressed down. They pure straight up devil. Ain't nothing Jesus about them. They just got an outward outfit on. That's all they got. But the garment in their heart that they really have on their hearts, it ain't even there. So the outward appearance don't impress me. It's what's in you. See, do you have that, that, that garment of Jesus Christ on? And see, this unity in Christ, you got to have Jesus Christ's garment on. Because we have to have a visible spiritual union that Christ is in us, that we're wearing his clothes. And so, everyone who sees someone who has put on Christ will only see the Savior. And this is why God, now, now, see, we talk about it on that end, Sister Pargo. But now let's look at it on the other side. This is why God can accept us even though we are sinful. See, it gets me how people say, God knows my heart. Yes, he does. But if you ain't got Christ garment on that's kind of a dangerous statement to make yes God knows my heart but I'd much prefer for God to look at me Deacon McKenzie and I'm clothed in Jesus Christ than to just look at me and I ain't got nothing on see because if he look at me clothed in Jesus Christ look when we put on Christ, God looks at us and sees what? Get this, his sinless son who completely covers us and pays for our sins. Y'all can talk about us Baptist preachers all you want to, talking about he died and he rose. When God looks at us, he looks at his sinless son. He looks at us as his sinless son. We are covered. We are protected. We covered by the blood. So Paul is not denying. And we look at scripture here. Paul is not denying that differences between nationalities or sexes that they exist. When you look at us as believers. But for the purpose of pursuing salvation, it does not matter who you are. Jews are no closer to reaching Jesus than Greeks are.
Lord, forgive me. White folks. Y'all ain't no closer to reaching Jesus than black folks. Black folks, y'all ain't no closer to getting to Jesus than white folks. It doesn't matter who you are. We ain't got no room to talk. You got to stand. How, how the saying goes, every tub got to stand on its own wood. Got to stand on your own bottle. <laughs> it don't matter what color you are. It don't matter where you come from. It don't matter where you was born. It don't matter nothing about your family history. You all got to stand for yourself. And so Paul, he's not denying that there are differences. But for the purpose of pursuing salvation, it doesn't matter who you are. Slaves do not have to be settled in their earthly affairs and become free before they can pursue God. And see, when you look back at slavery back in Bible times, either they owed debts, and so they were put in slavery until that debt was worked off. Uh, family members could buy them out of slavery, what have you. But they didn't have to wait until their earthly debts were clear and their affairs were settled before they could pursue God. Man do not gain no pre preferential treatment over women in the process of salvation. For all you dogmatic man out there that think you so, you know, uh, and, and you know, some teaching is, I'm the head. You ain't got no preferential treatment over women when it comes to salvation. All are equally sinners in the need of a savior. In Christ, we are all one. We're all the same. Simply put, we are all as filthy rags. Everybody done did some dirt. Some of us still doing some dirt. So Abraham's promise was inherited by his seed. Not seeds plural as in his descendants, but Christ who perfected Abraham's example of faith which would be credited as righteousness. Christ fulfilled the promise of Abraham by his complete faith in God, making him righteous. Plus, he also fulfilled the law, keeping him pure, which no one else had ever or would ever be able to do. He completed the law and shows us the example of faith. So when we hide ourselves in him, we too enjoy the fruit of God's promise to Abraham of what? Blessings, protection, and prosperity. Do you want to live by the law? Or do you want to be wrapped and clothed in Jesus Christ? See, only Jesus kept the law and kept himself pure. And then also completed the law by showing us an example of faith. Now, if we were to look at ourselves, ain't no way in the world I could follow the law completely and perfectly and go through it all. Ain't no way I could do it. I'm just being real. So why would we want to follow something that is guaranteed failure <laughs> than to get with something that we ain't even got to worry about all that. Because the Lord knows I'm going to fall short. But even in the midst of me falling short, Sister Fargo, all I got to do is what? Go to the Lord, get on my knees and pray, Lord, forgive me for my sins, forgive me for my shortcomings. Lord, help me to do better. And I'm good. Just as a mother, my mama used to whoop me and get on me about things that I knew I did wrong. But at the end, or but sometime before she whooped me, Sister Parker, she'd say, this is going to hurt me more than this is going to hurt you. And I'm sitting here like, woman, you whooping my tail with a switch and you talking about this is going to hurt you more than this is going to hurt me? Sister Clary, this will hurt me. I ain't understand that. But when you have kids and you look back now, you understand. Because see, one thing we have to look at is 
We failed our parents. We did something that just, you know, they didn't understand why, and, and you didn't, I didn't raise you better than that, and we disappointed them. But even in disappointment, Deacon Walls, she still gave me a hug. She still said, son, I love you. Now, I don't want you to do that again. Now, you done just tore my tail up. But then she showed me some love. And when she did that, Deacon Wall, it wasn't the whooping that made me want to do better. It was the love. And the fact that even though my mama whooped me, she still showed me some love, Deacon McKenzie. And I saw the look in her eyes. And I, and I saw what she was, was portraying to me, and it was like, I don't want to disappoint my mama again. I want to do better. So when you look at Jesus Christ, when you're down on your knees praying, that's all that's going on. You know you came up short. You know you did something you wasn't supposed to do. That's repentance. You know you said something that you shouldn't have said to your sister or your brother. That's repentance. And now when you come back, Jesus gives you that opportunity to do better. But if you was living under the law, that hand ain't growing back. You just got a nub. That's all you got. That foot ain't growing back. You just got a nub. So I'd rather live according to the promise and be clothed in Jesus Christ than live by the law. So my last question. In what ways are social, economic, racial, and gender differences causing spiritual hardships in the church? Who wants to tackle that one? In what ways are social, economic, racial, and gender differences, man and woman, Causing spiritual hardships in the church. Y'all thinking on that one, ain't you? <laughs> Come on now, I know somebody got it. Y'all keep it real now. Just, hey, just tell it like it is. Come on. Deacon Walls, you ain't got nothing? So it's glad I don't want to say that. Man, my Sunday school class, they don't want to tackle that question. <laughs> Look at how we in the church. We look at people according to the tithes they pay. Or what offering they give. And we want to show preferential treatment. Look at society socially. Kids in school because you don't dress like this. You ain't hanging with this clique. Uh, you're not a Republican. You're not a Democrat. Uh, when you look at gender, man, women, and you look at the differences. Now, we ain't even going to get into the homosexuality and all that stuff because that's Bible. Now, some of y'all might not like that, but that's scripture. So when you look at man and women and differences, how... You know, women paid this, man paid this. Uh, man's supposed to be in this role, women's supposed to be in this role, and we have this dogmatic treatment towards our women because maybe they're just supposed to stay at home and clean the houses and take care of the kids or what have you. So we look at all these different things, we put it all in a bag. This causes spiritual hardships when it comes to the church. Why does it do that? Because unfortunately, we bring all that stuff in the church. This is supposed to be a household of faith. We're supposed to all be believers in what? Jesus Christ. That did what? Set us all free. Covered us all. We covered by the blood. All of us that say we are Christians. Why do we bring outside Things in here that cause unnecessary hardships on the body of Christ. 
What are you more influenced by? Are you more influenced by Jesus or are you more influenced by society? Because society is hell in a bag. But when you come into God's house, we're supposed to have freedom in Christ. We're all on the same level. It doesn't matter because I'm up in the pulpit and you off in the pews. I can fall just like you can fall. I can lift you up, you can lift me up. We're all one. We are helpers one to another. So when you look at social, economic, racial, gender differences, it causes spiritual hardships in the church. And what can we as a church body do to eliminate these hardships? I'll give you one simple answer. Love each other. Love each other. Just as that mother loves her child. Just as God loves you. God knows I'm toe up from the flow up. But he loves me anyway. You know you got differences. Me and Deacon Walls, we ain't going to agree on everything. We got differences. We got an age difference. We got different views. We got different values. We got differences. But our differences should not cause such a rift that we bickering and fussing for 10 years. Over because he got a purple shirt on and mine ain't purple. That purple. Mine just a tint of purple. We shouldn't be bickering over things. We should love each other. And so as we close this morning, as families blend, some people will distinguish between their half-brother or stepsisters or adopted cousins versus their real relatives. So these differences are based on marriage or adoption. But this should not change our relationships or how much love is shared among family members. We should not treat family members inferior because they married into the family or they were adopted into the family. So regardless of color, economics, or any other social barrier, they are what? Family. In Christ Jesus, we are all children of God through what? Baptism. And God does not make distinctions between Jews, Gentiles, slave, free persons, or men and women. God don't make differences. And so regardless of who you are, what color you are, your background, we are all in the family of what? God. We're all God's children. And so there should not be any differences. But that is where we as people bring unnecessary hardships into the church because we make differences. We know we all different. We different shades of black. But some of us want more preferential treatment to a lighter skinned blacks than we do darker skinned blacks. It should not matter. We are all God's children. So next Sunday we're going to talk about because some of y'all probably done got mad at me now, so I better quit. So next Sunday, we're going to talk about the nature of Christian freedom. Bible background, Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. Printed text the same. Our devotion reading comes from 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 9 through 12. And I aim for change. We will discern the difference between legalism and freedom that comes with responsibility Experience freedom as trusting in the work of Christ rather than our own efforts of salvation. And choose a life of freedom in Christ that is guided by serving and loving others with humility. And just when you thought I was going to go, Deacon McKenzie, I want y'all to think about this question until next Sunday. Why is it so easy for believers to get caught up in the extremes of legalism or catering to their fleshly desires. So that's something to jump start you for next Sunday. Why is it so easy for believers to get caught up in extremes of legalism or catering to their fleshly desires? 
May God bless you all. May God keep you. And I pray that you got something wonderful out this lesson this morning. I'd like to thank Reverend Connor for that wonderful lesson. See how the lesson, the word of God can do to you. Uh, he started off, he was talking about how he dug into the lesson and how he was excited about it. But also, I just want to share the same thing because when I, when I read my lesson, I felt the same way because, you know, I've, I've talked to people that uh, don't believe in the New Testament. They just believe in the Old Testament. And this lesson here was talking about the promise. So the promise was in the Old Testament to let you know it's all pointing toward Jesus. Sometimes they're worried to do you like that. Even our pastor, when he started preaching, he'll start off, he started preaching, he might say, uh, this, this morning, my brothers and sisters, he'll start off calm. But by the end of that sermon, he hollered with a woo because that word worked on him. He's not only preaching to us, that word works on us and him at the same time. But I'd like to thank Ram Connor for that lesson. I pray that you come out and join us. Uh, Sunday school is, you can't get no better than that. The word, you get a chance to talk. We don't get a chance to talk to the pastor when he's up there preaching. But when you come to Sunday school, you get a chance to share your thoughts. I got a chance to hear Sister Pargo and her thoughts and Sister Clara and her thoughts and Deacon Wald. I even got a chance to speak my thoughts. So come on out and, and, and enjoy some of this Sunday school because I love it. I mean, that, I, I, I enjoyed the lesson myself when I, got, I, I, I read it. I didn't get fired up because I knew I didn't have to teach, but I did get fired up for the lesson. But I understand what Rem Connor was talking about. So I pray that everybody come out and join Sunday school live sometime. But if you don't, if you want to stay at home, may God continue to bless each and every one of you. Have a wonderful day. Yeah.